The basic point is we made you safe. We made you strong. We made you rich. What is your effing problem? Period. The end. Okay. We, be, we meaning scientists. Well, let's be more specific. Physics. Mm -hmm. Okay. I am physics adjacent in this conversation as a mathematician. But basically the key point is whether it was inventing molecular biology, putting you in instantaneous communication, inventing the semiconductor, the World Wide Web, give me a break. This stuff did not come out of nowhere. It's not all based on startups. Every scientist should learn that they produce a public good, which is both inexhaustible and inexcludable if done correctly. And the key question is, why do we see ourselves incorrectly? We are this incredibly dangerous ninja priesthood. And pretending that we are, I don't know, that science is interesting and it's good for you. And it makes it sound like some sort of, you know, we're trying to sell oatmeal or something. I'm not quite yeah. sure. Or pandering for our, our existence. Or... Well, which is absurd. The basic point is you have the world's greatest deal, which is that you keep us protected and able to work on things that we want to work on. And when you, you want to call on us, we're there. Mm -hmm. And when we start bad mouthing our own country, we are breaking the deal when they start saying, what is it that you are good for? You know, go get real jobs. They are breaking the deal. And I'm watching a bunch of people who don't even remember the deal. You don't remember what Vannevar Bush was trying to do saying, we won't do this work in national labs. We'll do it in universities. Maybe the idea is that it's too dangerous to do physics in an open environment. We took out two Japanese cities with a little bit of physics. Imagine what we could do if we really started pushing things. I mean, I think what people need to realize is science isn't always interesting. Sometimes it's dull as church. Sometimes it's the most riveting thing on the planet. It th it's not always successful. Sometimes it changes everything. Oftentimes it, it, it lags. But the key point is, it is absolutely consequential that the cavalier way in which increasingly this, this embittered tech right, which is very recent in its origin, I thought these guys were going to be our biggest friends and maybe even our saviors. And in part, lying about things like string theory and lying about things like cures for cancer and lying about peer review and pretending that public health is science when it absolutely in no uncertain terms, is not, has caused this rift. And so in part, what we have to do is we have to reinvent scientific credibility and institutional credibility to people who don't go to seminars. And I was at the Caltech colloquium last week in physics, and I didn't see anybody from the crowd of people that gets asked about science and technology policy. They're never there. They don't even understand the difference between a college and a university. A university's chief mission is not teaching. It is research and the mentorship of people who are to become researchers. Eric, you, are, you have dinners with those tech executives. What do you tell them? I fight alone, my friend. I mean, I'm having one tonight with, with very prominent people in the tech world. And my claim is... I will almost certainly be the only person defending science. And they will, they will look at me and they will say, you realize you're defending the people who attack you at your core in the physics community. But that's because you have integrity, Eric. And, and most many scientists don't. I, I think Avi does and he gets, he gets assailed, you know, maybe not as much as you do. But, but I think the, the comment you made about the... You've seen plenty of negativity thrown his way. The key point okay. is... Do you stand alone? When it comes time, a scientist does not fall back on peer review. They fall back on scientific method, consistency. And the key question is, are you willing and capable of standing alone? Now, the problem is we need more people in those tech dinners because if it's only one per dinner, if that. Okay, now, Eric, I'm, I'm happy to join you. I think it's, it's really important that you know, there was a sense of humility because many of these tech executives went to colleges, you know, and they studied there and they had some respect to the people who taught them, but it was lost because, because of the interaction that they had later on. So I think that it's really important to restore that. And, you know, it's not by these tech people being the tech support of the White House and controlling the conversation about AI. It's about natural intelligence, not artificial intelligence that we should isn't there a danger of the same thing happening? And I don't think I'm telling tales out of school. This is what happened with Mr. Epstein. But, you know, to replace tech bros by 
you know, he- super successful hedge fund entrepreneur that had connections all around the world. We can't figure out exactly what he did. But Eric, couldn't that lead to the economic incentives that you pointed out, which I agree with, but but couldn't that lead to this, you know, very d- dastardly influence of both non-scientific and maybe immoral or unethical individuals like Epstein? Look, the, the key issue is what, when I look at the unethical behavior of our colleagues in trying to destroy new ideas and the proponents of new ideas, I look at them and I say, would they be, would they be more ethical people if we paid them less and tried to starve them or we paid them properly? Mm-hmm. They weren't so marginal. And so I have this terrible problem, which is that my, my argument is you have to pay my enemies more if you really want them to evaluate my work. And this is a typical problem. It happened in the New Orleans Police Department, where you had an incredibly corrupt police department. New chief came in and said, we have have to pay everybody more so that they feel like they have something to lose and that they're valued within the system. So the key problem here is that the Sabina solution is to threaten to disconnect more of these people. And my solution is opposite, which is we've allowed scientists to become the precariat, precarious people who have to more or less follow incentives, jump on every NSF initiative, et cetera, et cetera. By the way, it's not, the physicists are not supposed to be paid chiefly out of NSF. The physicists are supposed to be ch- paid out of the Department of Energy, which is really the Department of Nuclear Weapons. Sabina very much criticizes uh, the next accelerator. And I think, you know, it's really important to, to advocate for getting as much data as possible in a way of learning about nature rather than shying away from experimental pro- programs. It's actually the opposite that we want to, to cultivate because the, that's the only path for learning something new, getting as much data, as much evidence. If you think that the axis of having higher energy will reveal new physics, that's what you should invest in. But the, the one thing that should not be done is suppress many initiatives that go in directions that are not traditional, which is what ha- and my approach to that, my solution to that is, you know, if you don't want to get dirty, don't mud wrestle. So there are all these people who invite me for mud wrestling and I just decline the invitation. So I le- it took me a while to learn that because initially I would respond, but um, as of now, I just do what I think is the right thing to do and avoid wasting energy on people who just, who just you know, invite um, the conflict. Yeah, but the problem that we're having in some of these areas is, is that we want to be honest about it, and we don't want to pay for our honesty with our lives, our support, and our careers. So right now, we have this really important thing that happened that we haven't discussed on this call anyway, which is Mark Andreessen's conversation at the White House that has been replayed numerous times. Well, I heard on a podcast also, he was saying, destroy all universities and rebuild them. Uh, no, no, no. Like- Eric, you're referring to the fact that he said if, if you discover something that the government will classify even up to mathematics. Is that right, Eric? That's right. So explain that to Avi, because I don't know if Avi heard that particular clip. What he said was that he was given a courtesy heads up as a billionaire, do not invest in AI. AI startups will not be allowed to be a thing. We are going to choose a couple of winners. We are going to make them giant corporations and we'll put them in a federal cocoon. And when Andreessen and Horvitz said back, I don't know how you're going to do this because that would mean that you'd have to classify mathematics, which is being taught everywhere and you can't classify math. They said, we took entire, entire segments of theoretical physics offline during the cold war and they went dark now the interesting thing is that there is absolutely no record of any physicist that i know being told this hey we're going to take portions of theoretical physics and we're going to make them go dark so the key question here is if that's true did the federal government pull off what in corporate consulting is called, management consulting, is called a soft sunset? A soft sunset is one in which you do not alert the people who are being downsized that they are being taken offline. 